routine. This week we are taking a different perspective on leadership. So last week we looked at how leaders have power and how they're able to use their power to influence their followers. This week we are looking more at the leadership styles and behaviors that somebody would use in order to determine if they are in fact an effective leader. So our goal is to figure out this week, what does it mean to be an effective leader? What would an effective leader do in the workplace? How would they go about um, influencing and motivating employees around them? So before we begin, before we begin, our task is to figure out uh, what does it mean for a leader to be effective? So I want you to just take a minute and think in your mind um, about what it means for a leader to be effective. Now, as students in the business school, there might be some preconceived notions you have about effectiveness and trying to measure effectiveness. Uh, for instance, we might consider how many new ideas a leader has developed. This is going to be particularly important for trying to maintain a competitive advantage in industries that are um, really competitive and driven by innovation. We might also think about uh, how much money that a leader has earned for the company, thinking about revenues and profits, or how much money they've saved, so how, how much money is left in their stores uh, or their reserves in order to use in the future, right? That would be a financial metric. Uh, but we might also consider um, how a leader influences and affects their workforce and their followers. So one measure of leader effectiveness might be how happy, productive, and committed uh, followers are. And this last approach here is the OB approach. So while it's true we might consider financial metrics or new ideas or production output, uh, when we're talking about organizational behavior, our focus all semester has been on increasing employees' performance and increasing their commitment. So our OB approach is really going to hone in on how our employees feel uh, about their leaders, and that is going to help us determine whether or not the leader is effective. So when we're trying to figure out how happy, productive, and committed are our followers, uh, this can be a bit of a task. So any leader is going to have multiple followers. So if we're trying to figure out how productive and committed uh, those followers are, it might actually depend on which employees we ask. So a leader uh, might have some employees that feel very um, satisfied with the leader, they're very productive, they're very committed to the workplace, and then we also have some followers uh, that are less committed, less hardworking, not as productive, right? So um, part of the challenge of honing in on employees' experiences is that we might see some differences in perspectives or perceptions of a leader. And this is going to take us into our first theory uh, associated with leadership style and behavior. Uh, and this theory emerged because researchers saw that employees often disagree in their evaluations of leaders, uh, where some employees think that uh, the leader is great and some employees think maybe the leader is not so great. This theory is called leader-member exchange theory. Uh, in short, we would call it LMX theory. Okay, so leader member exchange theory tries to understand why some employees might have positive evaluations of leaders and other employees might have negative evaluations of leaders. So in a nutshell, leader member exchange theory explains how leader member relationships develop over time on a dyadic basis. Uh, so when we're talking about a dyad, we're talking about two people. So it's, this theory is going to be looking at the leader and the relationship that leader has with individual employees on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So essentially, um, how do these relationships form and then how do these relationships uh, develop across time? So there are two sort of stages that are involved in leader-member exchange theory. 
Uh, the first stage is when a leader starts to form new relationships with followers. So this might be when a new leader or manager comes into the workplace uh, and is taking over, and so they must form new relationships with existing employees. Or this might occur when a new employee is hired and now they are working for that leader and manager and they are navigating a new relationship. So at the beginning of the relationship, this is called the role taking phase. So in the role taking phase, the leader provides uh, the employee with role expectations and the employee then tries to meet those expectations. So at the beginning, the leader is um, the one sort of setting the agenda and saying what's required. Uh, and then the employee is trying to meet those expectations based on um, what the leader is asking. Uh, in this sen uh, stage, the leader then gets a sense of the employee's talents and motivation. So they try to figure out uh, what the employee um, is doing, how they're doing, if they're a good employee or not a good employee. So they're taking an assessment of the individual. Then over time, um, once relationships become established, they start to move out of the role taking phase and instead move into the role making phase. So now, rather than the leader being the one that sets up all of the expectations, we start to see more of an exchange occurring where the follower is able to voice their expectations for the relationship. So here, the follower might want the leader to engage in certain behaviors or might have certain expectations for what the leader should be doing to help the employee. So with this role making phase, we start to see free flowing exchange. So there's uh, exchange of dialogue between the leader and the follower and both are contributing to this conversation. In general, if the employee is doing a good job, the leader will start to offer more opportunities and resources to see if the employee will take advantage of them. Uh, and by having more opportunities and resources, then the follower should offer more effort. Again, we see this in um, established relationships that are positive in nature. Now, not all relationships are really going to make it to this role-making stage where we see the leader giving more and the follower giving more. So some relationships are going to be much stronger than others. Uh, and the reason for this is that there are two different types of relationships that can be formed between a leader and a follower. So the first are called high quality exchange relationships. So this is when the leader and the followers exchange information and influence, support, and attention. So they're both invested in one another. They're sharing insights. They're sharing information. So if a problem were to arise, the employee would take it to their leader. Um, if the leader was aware of changes that were coming, they would share it with the followers. So you see a lot of um, open, open dialogue. Individuals that are um, included in the high quality exchange relationships are considered part of the leaders in group. So these are individuals who are in the circle of the leader that have strong relationships uh, with that leader. And generally speaking, these relationships are based on mutual trust, respect, and obligation. So both parties feel obligated to one another. Um, both parties respect each other's opinions and insights and look to the other person for their insight and, um, and ideas. However, uh, and you might have experienced this in the workplace, not all relationships are going to be high quality exchange. So unfortunately, there are times when leaders form low quality exchange relationships with their followers. So here we see a limited exchange of information, influence, support, and attention. Uh, in essence, these individuals might not feel any obligation to one another. Uh, there might not be an open, honest dialogue, uh, maybe the leader doesn't support the employee or the employee doesn't support the leader uh, and the leader's initiatives. So these individuals are considered part of the leader's out group. Uh, therefore, they're not part of that circle. They're not in this uh, influential circle. Uh, and that, of course, can have some uh, consequences for the employee and the leader. So here we see low trust, respect, and obligation. And you might also 
already be thinking of some of the leaders that you've worked for and some of the other concepts we've talked about in this class, right? We know that when trust uh, is low, that's going to have an impact on how employees behave. We know from our discussion on justice that respect is really important. If we don't feel respected, that's going to influence how employees behave. So um, again, what leader member exchange theory tells us is that some leaders have high quality exchange relationships with employees, these individuals form an in-group, while some um, employees are going to have low quality exchange relationships with the, follow, uh, with the leader. And that, of course, is going to be part of the leader's outgroup, which will then have consequences for their behavior. So um, I asked the question, do exchange relationships affect workplace outcomes? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, in general, the higher the quality exchange, the better the outcomes for employees. So when we look at organizational commitment, we see that employees who are engaged in high quality exchange relationships are less likely to leave their organization um, because they have that connection with their leader and um, they have this very strong mutual respect and obligation. However, this can become problematic because if the leader were to leave the organization, the uh, employee is also more likely to leave the organization. So in essence, they become committed to the leader and not necessarily to the organization. Uh, so the challenge is to have employees create these high quality exchange relationships uh, with more than one leader in order to help them become committed to the overall organization. When we look at job performance, uh, research also suggests that employees who are engaged in high quality exchange relationships uh, perform better and engage in more um, organizational citizenship behaviors. So what this means is that when somebody has um, mutual trust, when they feel supported, when they exchange free-flowing information with their leader, they're more likely to do their job uh, and they're more likely to go the extra mile and help out in all of those ways um, that aren't required but do benefit the organization, like engaging in voice and helping behaviors and engaging in good um, uh, civic virtue and things like that. So in general, um, a leader is going to be perceived as more effective by employees who are part of uh, that leader's in-group, and they're going to be perceived as less effective by employees who are part of the out-group. Uh, so really the goal is for leaders to focus on creating high-quality exchange relationships with employees. Um, so uh, this is just a quick diagram. It comes from the textbook. It shows how there's one leader, and in this case, there's four members. Uh, two members are high-quality exchange, and two are going to be low-quality exchange members. And just to note, um, this theory isn't always liked uh, by everyone because we don't often like the thought of a leader having differential treatment or differential preferences for certain followers but we do find that it tends to mimic reality. So a leader is likely to have very different relationships with some followers than others. And so even though it doesn't sound very leader-like to have these differential relationships, uh, it is sort of more in line with what actually happens in organizations. So as we mentioned, leader effectiveness is going to vary depending on who you ask uh, about how the leader is doing. And so our next task is to define then what do we mean by leader effectiveness? So if some employees view the leader as more effective than others, uh, what does that mean? This is one of the lengthier um, definitions for this class. So when we say leader effectiveness, we're talking about the degree to which the leader's actions result in the achievement of the unit's goals, the continued commitment of the unit's employees, and the development of mutual trust, respect, and obligation in leader member dyads. So essentially, to be effective, a leader has to help employees meet the goals, so they have to get employees to be productive, right? Job performance needs to be high. They also need to get employees to stay. So here we see organizational commitment being an important part of leader effectiveness. And they do so by creating these high-quality exchange relationships of mutual trust and respect and obligation.
So this idea about leader effectiveness has actually changed over time. So leadership has um, been long studied in organizational behavior since about the beginning, 1910s, 1920s. Leadership has been um, an area of inquiry for researchers. And what we have determined makes a leader effective has changed uh, across time, as you might imagine. So early theories of leader effectiveness focused on physical traits and what physical traits a leader might have and determining whether or not that would make them uh, a good leader. So for instance, um, these traits were, or these theories were often called the great man uh, theories because one, leaders were often thought to only be men and it was believed that there were certain physical characteristics that can make someone leaders like. So if you're very tall or you are very strong, uh, trying to focus on whether or not these, these characteristics could make someone a leader or not a leader. And to no surprise, these theories have really fallen out of favor and we know that a leader can come in many shapes, sizes, gender, sexes, uh, and so we've, we've definitely moved beyond these theories in our study. So modern theories of leader effectiveness tended to focus on personality and ability. So looking at different personality traits. So is a leader more effective if they are extroverted or introverted? And so you might remember when we talked about um, the big five personality traits, we looked at extroversion and leadership, and we said individuals who are extroverted are more likely to emerge as leaders. So what that means is when people are very outgoing and friendly and gregarious, um, other people tend to look to them as leaders, and so they're more likely to assume these leadership roles. Um, but there aren't really any findings that support this idea that personality actually affects leader effectiveness. So what that means is you can be introverted and be a great leader. You can be extroverted and be a great leader. You can be um, open to experience. You can be a little more reserved. So in general, there aren't you know, specific traits that a leader has to have because effective leaders demonstrate a range of different personality traits and abilities. So we've also um, somewhat moved away from these personality traits and that brings us to what we call today's theories uh, and our focus here is on leader behaviors. So rather than thinking about the traits a person has, we can focus on what behaviors they actually engage in to tell us whether or not they are effective. In particular, we're going to hone in on um, some specific behaviors like decision-making style, day-to-day -day behaviors, and the ways in which leaders choose to motivate employees. Uh, so by focusing on these three areas, we can evaluate and analyze a leader's behavior and say, are these behaviors effective uh, for motivating and um, getting our followers to perform and getting our followers to want to stay? So we're gonna focus on uh, the first of those behaviors which are called decision-making styles. So when we talk about decision-making styles, what we're looking at is the process the leader uses to generate and choose from a set of alternatives to solve the problem. So we're looking at the way or the method that a leader goes about trying to solve a problem. We are looking at how a leader decides rather than focusing on the outcomes of those decisions. So we're not trying to say, did they make a good choice? We're looking at what process, what style did they use to make that decision? So there are four different leader decision-making styles. And you'll see here we have this continuum where some styles are gonna have much more control by the leader and some are gonna give much more control to the followers. So the first leadership style is called the autocratic style. This is closest to high leader control. So we'll see here that um, basically the decisions are all made by the leader. So in an autocratic style, the leader makes a decision alone. Um, they do not look for um, insight or input from employees. So there's no um, asking for employees' opinions. They're not included in this uh, solution generation, nothing like that. So basically a problem exists and the leader goes about making a decision. The second leader decision-making style is called the consultative style. And so in this style, the leader does make the decision. At the end of the day, they're the one who has to make the final call. 
But uh, in order to support and facilitate their decision making, they do ask employees for their opinions or suggestions. So employees are able to give an opinion, they're able to evaluate whether or not they think something is a good idea, and then after hearing everyone's feedback, the leader takes all of that information and then ultimately makes the decision um, going forward. Now you'll see in these next two uh, decision-making styles, we're moving towards follower control. So we're going to see the leader having less of a role in the decision-making and giving more of that control over to followers. So in the facilitative style, the leader um, identifies a problem and presents that problem to employees and then asks the employees to come to a consensus to make a decision. So in this role, uh, the leader is a facilitator. So they're helping the other employees to come to a decision, uh, but the leader themselves does not make the decision. So the group comes to consensus and that determines how things will go forward. So for instance, imagine that a leader wanted to um, implement a different dress code. So the leader tells employees, we need to come up with a different dress code and it's up to all of you to make those rules. So instead of the leader saying you must wear X, Y, Z, uh, he turns this or she turns this problem over to the followers and allows the followers to evaluate the situation and come to a consensus and agree together. The final decision-making style is called the delegative style. And in this um, style, the leader gives employees the responsibility to make a decision. Uh, but sets up boundary conditions. So um, here the leader might say to employees, you need to come up with a new dress code, um, but the leader then really kind of steps out of the problem and says the dress code maybe needs to, um, I don't know, stick within a certain amount of you know pricing if we're going to have a uniform, or maybe the dress code needs to apply to um, all of the positions in the organization. So the leader sort of gives some parameters for what they want out of the decision, but then they're not involved in facilitating the conversation at all. Um, they sort of exit and allow employees to then come up with a solution on their own. So which of these styles is most effective? So I want you to take a minute and consider these four styles and, and think about what you perceive would be an effective leader. So as with most things in this course, uh, you might not be surprised to learn that the style that is effective is going to depend on certain circumstances. So we know that when we increase employee participation and we give them a voice, it's going to increase satisfaction and it's gonna increase their decision-making abilities. So what that tells us is the facilitative style, the delegative style are really good for allowing employees to be part of the process, which is likely to increase their satisfaction. But these types of decisions take time. And so trying to form a committee or forming a group and getting employee insight and trying to facilitate their conversations, all of that can be very time consuming and might not be necessary for every single decision. So as a leader, uh, one way to be effective is to look at the situational constraints and the factors uh, related to each specific decision that needs to be made, and then choose a decision-making style that matches those situational constraints. So this idea of matching the decision-making style to the situation is called the time-driven model of leadership. So essentially, the goal is to shift away from one leadership style. So you're not always going to be autocratic. You're not always going to be facilitative. Um, and this is important because in research involving leaders from top organizations, they asked them about their decision-making practices, and they found that leaders tend to overuse the consultative. So they tend to seek insight, maybe sometimes when they shouldn't. And they tend to underuse autocratic and facilitative. So sometimes a leader might need to just make a decision in that autocratic style, but they fail to do so perhaps because they think other people won't like it. And they fail to be facilitative in that they don't really help um, 
create the conversation and manage the conversation uh, the way they could. So the time-driven model of leadership tells us we need to get away from using just one leadership style and instead base the style we use on the situation. So the situational factors are going to determine which style is the best to use. So you'll see here, this is a diagram that comes from a textbook and um, <laughs> admittedly, it's not very clean, right? Uh, and so this was created to try to help leaders figure out what kind of style they should use. Uh, and so you'll see at the top here, there are seven different situational factors that need to be considered. So is the decision really important? Is it important that we have commitment? Does the leader have expertise in this area? What's the likelihood that people will commit? Are there shared objectives? How much expertise do employees have? How good of a job do our employees do working together in terms of teamwork skills? So essentially we evaluate each of these factors as being high or low. So let's say here the decision is very significant, so that's high, and we really need to get employee buy-in, so that's high, but maybe the leader has low expertise, um, the likelihood of people being committed is low, and so we kind of follow across, you know, high, low, high, low, until we get over here, which tells us which kind of leadership style we should be using. Um, again, this is not as friendly as, you know, maybe the initial researchers thought that it would be, but the idea is for leaders to think about different um, factors or different situational constraints and then use a decision-making style that is appropriate. So for instance, if you work in an organization and there's a lot of um, conflict and people don't really work well together, it would be very difficult to use the consultative or facilitative uh, decision-making processes because you might realize that nobody can work together to get the job done. On the other hand, if there's an issue that the leader needs to make a decision on and they don't have expertise in that area, they don't know anything about it, um, then the leader really can't make decisions by themselves or they're going to be uninformed. So if there's a time when uh, perhaps the leader needed to select a new software, a new human resource management software, Maybe the leader doesn't know a lot about human resource management, or maybe they don't know a lot about software. And so rather than making a decision that's uninformed, they choose to use one of those um, decision-making styles that is more follower-oriented. So thinking about um, the facilitative or um, the delegative styles. Okay, so the broad takeaways that I want you to get from this first part of the course uh, module is that leaders form different relationships with different followers, right? So we can have high quality exchange or low quality exchange. And if we form high quality exchange relationships with our employees, we're gonna be more likely to see positive outcomes like increased commitment and job performance. Um, so those high quality relationships are important for determining is the leader effective. And now as we transition into modern theories of leader effectiveness, what we choose to focus on are leader behaviors. So how does the leader behave and what do they do determines whether or not we think they're effective. So the first set of behaviors we can focus on are decision-making skills. And really what makes a leader effective is their ability to properly select a decision-making style based on the situation. So a leader who uses only one decision-making style is going to be much less effective than a leader who's able to vary their style depending on the situation. Okay, so that gets us through this first part of the, the module. Um, in the slides that follow, you'll be able to go through the remaining different behaviors that are important for leadership and determining whether or not a leader is effective. If you have any questions about this content, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm happy to help answer any questions. Have a great day.